Yes. So as I was saying, the history of Ayurveda, you know, is uh, lost in antiquity that we cannot trace. We can't see through the mists of time. Even when we look at the earliest texts of Ayurveda, they are already very organized and systematic. And we know the classical texts like Charaka, Sushruta, that are available today had already undergone extensive editing, uh, revisions and the refinement. We have lost also the original sources like Agnivesha Tantra is no longer available. So when we look at the history of Ayurveda, we are really trying to dig deep into, you know, the flow of time. And uh, most of the ideas about the origin of Ayurveda are conjectural, they're hypothetical, and, you know, we cannot be very definite uh, uh, in our conclusions. But it, it is quite evident that Ayurveda in those days had spread to the ancient world of those times. So we can see evidences of contact with countries outside India. I want to highlight this because today we are on the verge of a global resurgence of Ayurveda. And when we back into antiquity, we see that Ayurveda had also spread to the then existent world of those days. So a global outlook and a global vision is definitely you know, a hallmark of the Ayurvedic tradition. And India has shared very close contacts and there has been profound exchange of knowledge with our neighboring country, China. And China, in the name of China, figures in many classical Ayurvedic texts. The technique of pulse diagnosis, acupuncture, and vital points like the marmas are areas where there seems to have been very significant of knowledge between these two countries. Ayurveda texts also refer to the dietary habits of the Chinese people. There are historical records that Chinese scholars travel to India and you know the names of Fa and Sang are all you know, figuring in history textbooks. So it is not very clear what Ayurveda borrowed from Chinese medicine or what Chinese medicine borrowed from Ayurveda, but definitely there has been profound exchange of knowledge. There has also been contact with Greece. And we know today, although uh, uh, modern doctors see Ayurveda as a system or a tradition very similar to the Greece medicine. It is true that there has been also contacts between Greek medicine physicians and Ayurveda. There is also a lot of difference between Ayurveda and Greek medicine in terms of theoretical constructs. But there is historical evidence that during contacts like that of Alexander the Great, when he came to India, he was so impressed by the uh, you know, Ayurvedic physicians. In fact, when the Greek soldiers came to India, they were attacked more vehemently by the snakes of our country than even the soldiers. There was a lot of casualties to snake bites and it was Indian poison healers who actually you know attended to the snake bite victims in the Greek army and Alexander the Great was so impressed that he uh, you know took many Indian physicians with him back to Greece. So there are similarities between Greek medicine and Ayurveda at a superficial level though there are also a lot of differences, but the fact is that all these accounts indicate that Ayurveda had spread out of India 
and was some sort of a global system of medicine even in those days. Now it was through the contact with Arabian Arabic medicine that a lot of creativity happened in the medic world history of world medicine itself. And these contacts resulted in many classical Ayurvedic texts being translated into Arabic, Persian and other Middle Eastern languages and through this the knowledge of Ayurveda also spread out of India and the Mughal invasions to in India also led to the inflow of knowledge from both the Greek tradition and the Arabic tradition of medicine and that resulted in the formation of the Unani system of medicine and if you look at the word Unani it actually is coming from the word Yavana which is in Sanskrit for Greek so it is a reconstitution of or the Indian version of Greek medicine as it uh, emerged uh, while it was passed through the uh, Arabian scholars. So there have also been contacts with Europe and even in very recent past British visitors to India during the colonial period in the beginning stages we can find fascinating accounts of their uh, you know encounters and enchantment with the Ayurvedic system the smallpox inoculation was documented by Holwell in, and presented, uh, you know, to the Royal College of Physicians in 1767. And then the London Gazette published an account of nose reconstruction surgery being performed by the Porter community in Pune. And all this, and this inspired the development of plastic surgery in modern medicine. So I would like to begin this discussion by pointing out that Ayurveda had extended itself globally even in ancient times. And this global recognition of Ayurveda is today that is happening is not something that is completely new. Having said this, I would like to point out that any student of Ayurveda who takes to the Ayurveda course in India must realize that we are blessed with the unique privilege of being part of a very unique and complex healthcare system. India is perhaps the only country in the world which nurtures a pluralistic healthcare setup, where different medical systems, you know, can be practiced in a legal manner. This is not possible in many parts of the world. So we do find in countries like the United States and Europe, Ayurveda is beginning to emerge. There are schools which offer courses in Ayurveda, but it is not possible to practice Ayurveda with the freedom that we have in India. The problem with the Indian healthcare system has been that while we have promoted pluralism, coexistence, India has not really promoted cooperation between the medical systems. And there I would like to say, when you have all joined the BMS course, we are on the verge of a great transition, a great turning point, even in this healthcare framework of our great country. The Niti Aayog recently has come up with this new healthcare policy of one nation, one medicine, to truly bring uh, all medical systems under one integrative framework and to move from coexistence to cooperation. So, so I think it's a historically very important moment that you are all entering into the study of Ayurveda because we are on the verge of transforming India's healthcare system. I'm of course thinking very wishfully, hoping that this great vision will find manifestation and it is the responsibility of all of us to ensure that this happens. So please be proud to be part of a very unique uh, healthcare system in the world and also 
that you are all going to be part of this unique experiment, this unique transformation of India's healthcare system into a truly integrative, cooperative, people-centered system. Because human biology is very complex. Human nature is very complex. It is not possible for one medical system to completely understand the workings of the human body. For this reason, in the field of healthcare today, there are so many unmet needs. So when we are studying Ayurveda, I think at the very outset, it is very important that we bring this patient-centeredness into the focus. We are there, Ayurveda is getting recognized because the existing approaches to healthcare is not able to fulfill all human needs. And that is also a great privilege that by studying this medical system, this healthcare system, we will be able to address unmet needs of human society, not only in India, but all over the world. So Ayurveda has fascinated people all over the world from time immemorial, immemorial, as I was trying to highlight through these slides, and it continues to. And today we are again on the verge of taking this knowledge of Ayurveda to a global audience. And I would also like to emphasize at this point that while we must have feel all the pride and privilege of studying Ayurveda, let us not enter into hostility or confrontation with modern medicine or other medical systems. Because different medical systems enable us to get a better understanding of the human body. So it is this idea of cooperation and collaboration on the basis of which we have to enter into the realm and study of Ayurveda. I'm telling this because we still see in India a tendency of Ayurvedic physicians to learn Ayurveda, but then move towards the practice of modern medicine, which, which would be extremely disastrous. So at the outset, when we are all beginning to start the study of Ayurveda, we must set our goals very clearly that we must learn the strengths and uniqueness of Ayurveda and become part of a collaborative, integrative framework where the unique contributions that Ayurveda can make to society should be expressed through us. It's a very big responsibility, a great responsibility. And by rising up to this occasion, we may be able to fill really huge gaps and challenges in the healthcare system, not only of India, but the entire world. The next point I want to talk about is how Ayurveda has been open and how the pursuit of science and uh, you know scientific medicine has always underpinned the great experiments and explorations that has happened in the Ayurvedic tradition. I'm sure you have all heard of science fiction. Science fiction is a very, very important, uh, you know, intellectual exercise that enables human imagination to expand. And it is through these science fictions that even new discoveries are later made. I mean, it is giving wings to our imaginations. But there is a difference between science fiction and scientific and myths. You know, myths are extreme exaggerations, imagination running wild, whereas science fiction is more about possibilities in science, things that have not yet happened, but which are very likely to happen through scientific innovation. And if you look at many of the uh, accounts in classical Ayurvedic texts and in the Indian tradition, we can find that we also have a very rich heritage of science fiction, medical scientific fiction, rather than, you know, they shouldn't be dismissed as myths. So if you look at birth myths, it's quite fascinating to see how in our tradition there have been ideas 
conceptions about extra uterine fertilization, extra uterine gestation, cloning of fetuses, surrogate mothers, external influence during intrauterine lives, asexual reproduction. So all these science fiction elements you can see in the Ayurvedic tradition. I wanted to highlight this to show that Ayurveda is not against technology. It is not against scientific exploration. I'm not trying to point out that all these things had actually happened in those times. What I'm saying is that it does, it's not necessary that even these practices really took place. It represents an attitude for scientific innovation and technological development. So if you see extra uterine fertilization, you can see. So these science fictions were even part of religious literature, of spiritual literature. In the West, there has been a real conflict. Uh, and there has been this discussion that science and uh, religion has always been, you know, in confrontation that and it was that religion prevented the development of science. If you look at the Indian tradition, we will not see such a conflict. Even in our religious discourses, there are, uh, you know, shocking or, uh, you know, mind boggling revelations of science fiction. So all these accounts are coming from such literature. Shiva and uh, Parvati, the birth of Lord Subramanya is an example of extra uterine fertilization. Agastya, sage Agastya is an example of extra uterine gestation. Cloning of fetuses, the story of Kauravas. Surrogate mothers, the Kritika damsels who nurtured Lord Skanda. And we see how Abhimanyu was influenced during intrauterine life. The story of Prahlada and all these things are now being corroborated with new scientific discoveries in modern science, how children are responding to language even while they are in the uh, intrauterine life and how they can recognize the sound of their mother and even their father. So all these things we can see. There have been, apart from birth myths, there are also medical myths, preservation of dead bodies you can see in Ramayana. I mean, uh, reviving the dying with special herbs, emergency medicine, the concept of Sanjeevani, restoring youth through transmigration. In the Rig Veda, which is very, very ancient, you find the first account of artificial limbs. So if I was also, when I first read these accounts, I was quite fascinated. Am I really reading literature from 3000 years ago or is it from our contemporary times because they are talking about technologies which are just beginning to emerge today. The queen is injured in the uh, war and then immediately the Ashwinis come and fix artificial limbs. She go back to fight and then wins the war. I mean, this is uh, completely astounding. It's like a modern uh, surgery, you know, where you go into the hospital and just walk out just like that with prosthetic limbs. And today in Italy, there is uh, really a very serious attempt being done to do transplant of the head. Serious experiments, already research papers have been published about these possibilities. And head transplant is described in the classical Ayurvedic texts, the most difficult and the most impossible organ transplant has been discussed in the classical Ayurvedic texts. The Ashwinis are said to have made artificial denture. Pushan was a sage whose eyesight was restored by a surgical procedure. So we can see that Ayurveda was really, you know, uh, aspiring for such technological innovations and great feats of intervention, even in those days. So this science fiction is an inspiration and it, it points out to us that there is no limit to the developments and innovations that we can make in the field of medicine. There are also very interesting research myths which, which again show how uh, this whole scientific enterprise in Ayurvedic tradition was so lively. There is the story of Bhikshu Atreya who asks a student at the end of the course, 
to roam around and bring a herb that does not have medicinal value and everybody comes back with one plant or the other but one student is missing he comes back after a long time empty handed and when the teacher asks him why is it that you have not brought a single plant that does not have medicinal value he replies by saying that i couldn't find one every that i examined seem to have some medicinal property or the other so this is the spirit of scientific inquiry this is a spirit of observation and you can see when the examination system in those days was actually very robust and very creative now i would like to highlight through a pictorial representation of how vibrant the tradition of ayurveda was this is very representative uh, on one side you can see the map of ancient india spread out and there are names of books i have only put representative names if the countless texts that are there in an ayurvedic tradition were to be superimposed on the map of india we wouldn't be able to see india at all it would be covered by a pile of manuscripts and books every region in the country will have contributed at least one text in some period of time and here you can see the annular rings of a tree and in every time period some new text or some new acharya has manifested this is very very important to understand that the chrono geographical spread of ayurveda is testifying the vibrance of this tradition ayurveda has never been a static tradition it has been continuously updating itself from every nook and corner of the country the epicenter of ayurvedic excellence has also shifted from place to place in more recent times kerala has been an epicenter for you know preservation and development of ayurveda but there was a time when bengal was the vangadesha was you know the stronghold of ayurveda at another period it was gujarat so every part of the country this cycle has shifted and has and the excellence in ayurveda has been evolved over over the centuries this is quite fascinating i very much doubt if there has ever been a tra medical tradition that has been so vibrant and so diverse in its evolutionary history as ayurveda has been and also if you look at the names of the great teachers of ayurveda I have just put some names here the first teacher the propagator of siddha medicine the one who composed the first ayurvedic text and all that but there is an interesting book by a dutch scholar mulenbelt history of indian medical literature when i was going through this one of the volumes of this text i was stunned to see the names of acharyas that he has listed it runs into pages and pages thousands and thousands of people names who have contributed for the development of ayurveda this is quite amazing we hear only about charaka sushruta when we study history or when we learn about ayurveda i don't think even today's graduates of ayurveda have an idea of the depth and extent of individual contributors our tradition is known to be very anonymous i mean we didn't want to project our names many times and some of the names were also kind of honorific titles so there must have been many vagbadas many charagas but in spite of this limitation if you look at mulenbelt's textbook of history you are just overwhelmed by the names of acharyas and scholars and physicians that has been listed there so it is not the result of you know one mind ayurveda has emerged by a churning of countless minds over a long period of time and covering large geographical areas it is fascinating to see that in the charaka samhita in discussions there are people from other countries also coming and participating in the discussion so it there were i think the first international conference on ayurveda happened somewhere in the himalayan region you know in a time period which we cannot even trace so this is 
And if you look at the codified writings, I don't I don't know whether the word codified writings is the right, because in Ayurveda we did not believe in writing things. It is an oral tradition. So these are codified knowledge. They are necessarily not writings. Happened much later. It's unimaginable how such sophisticated texts were preserved through the oral tradition. Because if you look at the type of writings, the Samhitas, Nikhandu, Sutras, Koshas, Vyakhyas, Yoga Sangrahas, Prakarna Granthas, the structuring of these textbooks are so precise, so different for different purposes. And they were able to preserve innumerable texts like this, you know, over millennia. Even when writing, because a lot of manuscripts were burned during the invasions. And it is said that just because of the phenomenal memory, like even the Vedic tradition, you know, the Vedic oral tradition has been recognized by UNESCO as a world, intangible world heritage. Because it's just unimaginable how the Rig Veda or the Yajur Veda has been transmitted for thousands of years without distortion, even the method of pronunciation, you know, in the Vedic chanting is very, very special that has been preserved without any distortion over so many thousands of years. So that that is a phenomenal uh, kind of achievement. Ayurvedic texts, we lost a lot, but, but for the oral tradition, much of these textbooks wouldn't have even been preserved. Recently, there was a study and I think when you are all coming to study and learn Ayurveda, we must understand the importance of Sanskrit also. Now, there was a study done by some scientists that has been published in the current science journal, in which, you know, the scientists took two groups of people. One group would look at the words written in Devanagari script. The other group would look at the same words written in transliteration in English. And they did a functional MRI to see what happens in the brain when people read the same content written in Devanagari script and in transliterated Roman transliterates. And to their surprise, they found that the way the brain responds when reading the Devanagari script and the transliterated Roman script is very different. More parts of the brain get activated when you are reading the Devanagari script. So I want to also point this out as students of Ayurveda, please don't uh, shy away from reading Sanskrit. Because all these phenomenal achievements were made by stimulating and expanding the brain. The, the word brain, brih, is also in English, it's coming from the Sanskrit brih to increase Brahma. It's connected with that, that which has the ability to expand and grow. That is the meaning of the word brain. And Sanskrit is a language that was designed to facilitate this expansion. So if you are reading the Devanagari script today, that this practice has come to globalize Ayurveda. We are converting all original Devanagari script into transliterations. And this is at the cost of brain development. If you are chanting some verses in the morning before you start the study of Ayurveda, don't think it is a lalavi, it is not a, a ritual. You are actually doing a very sophisticated practice to awaken, massage your brain. Just like you are warming up before you are doing sports, you know, warming up exercise. The chanting of classical texts is a very good warming up exercise for your brain. In fact, a scientist at the University of Trent in Italy did a study of Vedic chanting and, they, and this scientist found that people who were memorizing and chanting the verses, Vedic verses, you know, certain parts in their brain like the hippocampus, areas associated with memory, emotional control, these areas were becoming bigger and stronger and this if Scientists called this as the Sanskrit effect. This has been published as a research paper. So when we are missing out these aspects of traditional learning, like reading from the original text in the Devanagari, memorizing and repeating it, you know, in group chanting, 
you know, we are getting a very profound effect on our brains. We are preparing our mind and brain for an intellectual activity. There is a school in uh, London where it's, it's a Christian missionary school, but they are teaching Sanskrit. There. And one of the professors there, when he was asked, what is the uniqueness of Sanskrit? He said, you know, all languages in the world are known by the place where it is spoken. English in England, Hindi in Hindustani, Kannada in Karnataka, Tamil in Tamil Nadu, German, Germany, French, France. But the word Sanskrit is universal. It just means Sanskritam or refined. It is the most refined uh, human language. It is created for refinement of the human mind. And the students and parents and teachers swear in that school that why they are teaching Sanskrit is that it enables the human mind to develop completely. Because we know we have two types of brains, the right brain and the left brain. One is more emotional, artistic. The other is more intellectual, mathematical. And it's very, very important to be complete human beings that we stimulate both sides. And Sanskrit is such a unique language that if you read Sanskrit literature, it is a perfect blend of both science, art, poetry, human aesthetics, mathematics, everything blends so beautifully. And if you learn Sanskrit, your mind, your brain also develops in a more harmonious way. So this is also a great privilege when you are learning Ayurveda, you are going to learn Sanskrit. That is, I think you have to put an effort to do that. It's also possible to learn Ayurveda nowadays by skipping the study of Sanskrit, but please don't do that. So this is a fascinating structure. Technical writing in Ayurveda was so specialized. I don't want to go into that. And it is through this tradition that some of the great Samhitas, if you look at a Samhita, it is almost like what we call a systematic review today, which is the highest level of evidence. Whatever knowledge is available up to that point of time had to be reviewed to create a Samhita. So it is very equal to a Cochrane review or something, evidence at the highest level of expression. And you can see this is what Charaga says, Yadihasti Tadanya Tannehasti Natat Vachit. It does, it's not a dogmatic expression. Charaga says whatever is here can be found elsewhere, but whatever is not here, you cannot find anywhere else. When that statement is made, it is relevant for that period of time. It doesn't mean that it's always the same. He says, what I have done is a systematic review of everything that is available. So I've not missed out anything. So here is an account and that is the way the text has to be updated also. That is a message you get from the Charaka Samhita. So the Samhitas are, you know, to say levels of evidence, systematic review, meta-analysis stand at the top because they give you a bird's eye view. The best evidence that is available has been codified and brought a, an Ayurvedic Samhita is like this. It's very important to understand that. And you know, if you look at the greater triad, the philosophy, history and philosophy of Ayurveda, I want to highlight this should be very inspiring for students of Ayurveda. Ayurveda was a very student-centric tradition. The Charaka Samhita, which has become the celebrated textbook in Ayurveda, how many of us really think of it? We know that, but we don't realize that it is actually a student's loss. It was a student's note that became the most celebrated textbook in Ayurveda. When Agnivesha Tantra was written, Atreya Samhita disappeared. The teacher completely disappeared because the teacher acknowledged the student's work, you know, as the textbook for the future. So I don't think there is any uh, teaching tradition in the world that has put the students above everything else. Agnivesha was very intelligent, but that doesn't mean that the others did not compose. They also composed texts. So it is a, it is a whole story of student empowerment. Sushurta is also, it is, all these books are known by the name of the student rather than that of the teacher. And when it comes to Vagda, he didn't call it as Vagbada Samhita, he called it as Ashtanga. There's a big shift there. It's the first time that a book is being known by the content rather than by the author. 
so the older textbooks were known by the name of the authors and students always known by the name of the students today we we can realize that today we don't even have, we don't have that expansiveness of our mind to accommodate a student no teacher wants the student to become the author of the knowledge that has been transmitted so that's a greatness of our tradition and agnivesha is questioning atreya at the end with all humility how you can question a teacher and with humility is described in uh, ashtanga hridayam after an entire study agnivesha is telling atreya that i am not convinced but what you have been teaching me doesn't match with my observations he asks it but he gets the permission of his colleagues before they ask that question that is the idea of anyway bhagavadinam sambado bhakti namra after getting the permission he asks his colleagues shall i ask this question because i am not convinced and the colleagues say yes so even the agnivesha as a student was actually representing his whole class that was the solidarity of the students with the permission of his colleagues agnivesha is asking atreya the blunt question i don't believe in ayur so my dear students don't think that you have come to a tradition if you really understand the tradition it is a most liberating most expansive tradition that you are all going to study and it's what is most fascinating is that the story of the greater charaka sushruta and vaghada itself represents the spirit of knowledge building what does the name charaka means charai vedi charai vedi he is the wanderer charaka indicates that to acquire knowledge you must travel everywhere every nook and corner of the world even sushruta tells that same thing nadishu shailesu sarasu chaapi vanneshu aranyeshu tathasrameshu sarvatra sarva parimargidavya sarvatra bhumi hi vasu nidate so we don't the earth is offering its treasures in every nook and corner of its surface so let no place be left unexplored that is the spirit of exploration so when you study charaka samhita it is the spirit of exploration that has to be you know conveyed and sushruta is the great listener susrutam na shrutam yena shruti listening is a very very important thing so keeping your mind open that is what susruta says and that is why susruta is that acharya who says that uh, you know ekam shastram adhiyano na vidya shastram he tells you to learn all shastras listen to other experts also whereas charaka says you must go deep ekasmin navyasya shastre laddhas kada sunya da bisat shastram vitna tatra vadede so charaka is representing the spirit of deep exploration and susruta is asking you to be a keen listener to learn from all possible sources and vagbada vachi bada is a great communicator so this the three brahatra is through the three acharyas represent the spirit of knowledge building this is so beautiful i don't think there is any tradition in any system of knowledge which where the books and the authors itself symbolically represent the spirit of knowledge building so explore and acquire knowledge listen and acquire it and then express it so that you know you share it also that sharing is very very important that is what makes vagbada very uh, impersonal so if you see when it came to vagbada he is not vagbada samhita it is ashtanga sade because he is communicating the others are acquiring knowledge and vagbada is a communicator now the subject is to be dispersed and he uses a beautiful term hridayam hridayam means that which it receives the digested essence of the food and circulates it everywhere so that is the spirit of communication of sharing so this is a very beautiful uh, you know framework in ayurveda where if you learn it through the in deeper significance that sanskrit words convey you get very deep insights now in ayurveda we have had great contributions dr kishore is there who had also written this article on heart and circulation ayurveda was one of the earliest systems to talk about circulation and i feel you know 
we are trying sometimes to say that ayurveda knew about circulation the way modern medicine knew it i want to point out no there is something still new to be discovered in circulation that was written in ayurvedic texts and this can add to modern knowledge that is the way we must present it let us not say that ayurveda knew circulation before harvi what i would like to say is even today modern medicine does not know things about circulation which ayurveda had understood because modern medicine it's blood circulation in ayurveda it is rasa chankraman rasa and rakta have been physiologically distinguished in ayurveda and there is a very important reason for this is only rasa dadu that can reach every nook and corner of the body if the blood comes out of the capillaries it is bleeding but rasa dadu uses out rasa dadu is only dadu rasati ahar ahar gachati there is a new model of physiology we can create and a new idea of circulation if you look at the classical ayurvedic texts but instead we are only trying to say that we also knew about circulation what harvey discovered was the mechanics of circulation but in ayurveda we have deeper conceptual insights and that needs to be highlighted we have brain and mind there are many the word cerebrum is coming from a sanskrit word which is shiro brahma cerebellum is very similar to shiro viloma shiras is the seat of prana and heart is the seat of consciousness this is a very very important description when you study ayurveda when i was a student i had a doubt why is the my why we say the heart is the seat of awareness consciousness pradayam chetana sthanam i was very puzzled out of this but you know the mind and consciousness are different this is very very important in ayurveda consciousness or the self or atman is different from the manas the manas the seat of the manas has always been the head it is the seat of consciousness that is the heart and today there are many new findings which are pointing out that you know for example when your emotions when you are very emotionally affected your heart changes its shape i don't know how many of you have noticed uh, heard about this if you take an x ray when you are sad your heart will change its shape this is called as takotsobu cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome in japan they did x rays of people who were in grief and they found their heart shape had changed if you are happy also your heart shape will change but it will change in a different way so just by looking at an x ray image if you are intensely gripped by both happiness and sorrow your heart is affected so consciousness emotions there is a link with the heart which ayurveda had recognized so many centuries ago chakravani says अति चिंतना तथा दुखावेशा हृदय मॉडल मेडिसिन but to ayurveda we can give another angle another understanding of human physiology and that is what as in so ayurveda you should try to understand newer theories of gut brain axis how the stomach and the brain are related how parkinson's disease could begin from the gut and not the brain this was an idea in ayurveda so many centuries ago we had the theory of today we know the microbiome uh microbiome means our body is actually having trillions of bacteria many of us may not be aware of it in fact it even appears that we may actually be a huge bacterial colony and not really even a human being because these microbes outnumber our cells we are more bacteria than human cells so the this is really a paradox and a interesting thing because the most evolved species is coexisting with the most primitive species the old and the new are coexisting we had a very nice concept for this in sanskrit puranam puranam does not mean old pura api navam that which is new even though it is old our human body is really a, a synthesis of the past and the new the past never leaves the entire bacterial colony in our body had access to the remotest past past the beginnings of life itself so the most evolved cell is coexisting with the most primitive cell 
And in Ayurveda, we talked about Sahaja Krunis. And looking at the time period in which this was discussed, this is amazing. Sahaja Krunis and, uh, and other Shana Krunis, Krunis which we cannot see with our eyes. And Anantya, they have been named, described. So when you look at the descriptions in Charaka, Chakrapani, and Dalhana, it's almost that you know they are pointing to this microbiome, the coexistence of these microorganisms in the human body, which are innumerable, so many thousands of years ago. Even when it comes to genetics, you can see in Ayurveda there has been fascinating insights, the idea of Bija, Bija Bhaga, and Bija Bhaga Avayava. You to even have a genetic theory of disease. So many thousands of years ago, as you see in the Sharirasthana of Charaka Samhita, it's quite mind-boggling that the body is represented as in a bija form, and each of this bija has parts and parts of parts, and every organ in your body is represented by in this bija, by part and by part of part. And if any small part is affected, upatapa, it could be upatapa or upadhada. Upatapa means partial damage then you have a partial problem. If it is a damage, then that organ is missing or there is a severe genetic problem. And we are very tempted to correlate these three levels. I'm not saying they are the same, but you can see conceptually modern science has also come to a very similar understanding that genetic information is coded at three levels, the chromosome, the gene, and the DNA. And this echoes the old Sanskrit idea in Saraksam, Bija, Bija Bhaga, and Bija Bhaga Veva chromosome, gene, and DNA. So aseptic surgery, this is also important. So I'll complete in the next few minutes. Uh, we are coming to the end of our discussion. The aseptic surgery is very important in Europe until very recent times, until the discovery of antiseptics and antibiotics. Even historians have pointed out that surgery was nothing but butchery. People used to die of infected wounds after surgery. And today in the era of antibiotic resistance, we are once again, you know, looking back into that historical time when surgery was butchered. Uh, if any surgery was conducted, the wounds would get very badly infected and people would die of sepsis. But this was unknown in the Indian tradition. You have in Sushruta Samhita very clear instructions that instruments should be heated before it is applied for surgery. Anyatha Paga Bhayat. Sushruta very clearly says there will be Paga Bhaya otherwise. Paga Bhaya is nothing but separation and sepsis of the wound. We had in Ayurveda Rakshogna Karma. Makshikas, even vectors were described that insects will come and put microbes into the wounds and they will cause infection. So surgery, aseptic surgery was practiced in India. Today we have this controversy now of surgery being reintroduced into Ayurveda. Uh, uh, of course, that needs to be discussed in a very objective manner. But what I'm saying is definitely in Ayurveda, we had uh, you know great contributions made in the field of surgery, some of which even from a historical point of view has not been adequately recognized. Sushruta is known for plastic surgery, but I think his contributions go way beyond that. And even in dead body dissection, I want to highlight a very interesting concept. Sushruta says, Avarsha Shatikam, don't take bodies that are more than 100 years old. When I heard when I came across this word, I was very surprised. What does this mean? Why is he specifically telling not to take bodies which are more than 100 years old? Does it mean that in his times it was difficult to get dead bodies of people less than 100 years old? If that is the case, then it means that Ayurveda was really able to help people achieve longevity in his time. It was not common for people to die before 100 years old. So Shushruta is telling if you want to dissect a body and understand anatomy correctly, you must choose a body that is less than 100 years old. I don't think we have to ever say that in today's world, because very rarely we will get a body that is more than 100 years old. So toxicology is another branch, snake poison healers. And I want to highlight one experience that I had with traditional physicians in Kerala. 
you know, diagnosis. They developed ingenious methods of diagnosis. There is a medicine called Vishahari Lehi. So when a patient is bitten by a snake, one of the big challenges, we don't know what type of snake has bitten. So these healers, what they do is they put nasyam and anjanam. So they revive the patient's consciousness. Then they give this Vishahari Lehi. Depending on the taste the patient perceives, they are able to identify what type of snake has bitten. Which means that the ingredients in the medicine interacts in, with the tongue of the patient and produces a taste sensation. I have tasted this medicine, it is actually very bitter. But I have seen patients coming and saying that I am feeling a sore taste or I am feeling a pungent taste or I am feeling a sweet taste and then immediately the Vaidya would say that this is crate or cobra or viper and then the treatment is given. So another thing is also about specialization. Ayurveda had great specialists and what I am very fascinated to see is the specialization has sometimes gone beyond eight branches. You will realize that Ayurveda had eight branches. I am not repeating that. But what is fascinating is that we find that there are terms like Arbudatnya. Somebody who is specializing only in Arbuda. Artha Chintaga. This is mentioned by Charaka Samvida. Artha Chintaga and Chakrabani says Hrudeya Chintaka, which is an ancient term for perhaps cardiologist. Hrudeya Chintaka, who is thinking only about the heart and its manifestations. For wound healing, people who, who had specialized knowledge about wounds. So these kind of things are also mentioned. Okay, so here are some simple uh, uh, concepts about how modern research has happened. What I want to say is all this modern research has happened. I'm not, I'm just skipping through these slides. These are accounts of modern research on Ayurveda. And I have to tell a little painfully that most significant research on Ayurveda in modern times has been done by non-Ayurvedic people, not by people within the field of Ayurveda. If you look at pre-colonial period, you have Britishers, then you have Portuguese like Garcia da Horta or a Dutch person developing the Hortus Malabaricus. Indian Ayurvedic uh, scholars are missing in most of these uh, efforts. We have been, you know, just practicing or doing, living in our own world. And in most modern times, there have been research on ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology, but all this has happened through the efforts of people outside the field of Ayurveda. And I think this is something which we must also keep in mind as students of Ayurveda. We must aspire to make original path-breaking contributions in the field of Ayurveda. Today we had the Nimitli movement, the TKDL, then Nimitli is a new millennium initiative for technology leadership in India, where for the first time a golden triangle concept bringing modern science, Ayurveda and traditional medicine together. Dr. M. S. Valyatan brought this concept of Ayurveda biology, how modern biological sciences and Ayurveda can be brought together. But you can see all these are done by modern scientists. So it is great it's time that we take the leadership for research and development of Ayurveda from within our tradition itself. So I'd like to conclude now to summarize the philosophy of Ayurveda in six key concepts. First of all, I want to point out that, you know, you are studying a, a great system of thought in the field of healthcare in the form of Ayurveda, which is very comprehensive, very futuristic, and yet very ancient. And it has a lot of scope for development. It is not that we have to just go back and do the practices that happen in those times. There is a lot of scope for developing it to make it suitable for modern times. And these six central points, I think, summarizes the philosophy of Ayurveda. First and foremost, Ayurveda is nature-centered medicine. We all talk about person-centered. No, Ayurveda is first nature-centered. So we say that uh, the human being is a representation of nature and that for the people living in a locality, the plants growing there are the most suited. So global localization, we must think globally, but act locally. Then it is person-centered medicine. After it is nature-centered medicine, it is person-centered medicine. The pandemic has pointed out to us how nature-centeredness is important. How if nature is not healthy, we cannot be healthy. 
Then Ayurveda is mind-body medicine. It is one of the earliest systems that clearly talked about mind-body connections. The Vata, Pitta, Kapha, Manas concept is very sim uh, is re-echoed through the modern concept of PNEI axis or psycho-neuro-endocrinoimmunology, where there is a continuous crosstalk between the mind and the body. And Ayurveda is a combination of lifestyle, diet and medicine, all the three together. And its interventions are multi-model. It's a very complex way of, you know, intervening in medicine. And most important, Ayurveda is talking about healthy aging. I think this is one of the greatest contributions that Ayurveda can make in today's world. Today, NCDs or non-communicable diseases responsible for 70% of morbidity and mortality. When Ayurveda students or doctors are wondering how they can make a mark in society. My take on this is that four diseases, if you can focus, heart disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, and diabetes, they account for 70% of the world's morbidity and mortality. And these are areas where in some way Ayurveda can help in different stages. Even if you just specialize in four diseases, the contribution you can make to global healthcare would be mind boggling. And healthy aging is a very, very important thing. Ayurveda says that when we age, we can age healthily. We can preserve cognitive abilities. We can have functionality. There will be some degeneration, but it is possible to be self-reliant. And this is so, so important in today's world where the old age population is on the rise. And healthy aging is an area where Ayurveda can contribute. So to summarize and conclude, I would like to say that we must consider that getting an opportunity to learn Ayurveda at this point of time. I'm looking 30, 35, 38 years behind when I was a student, things have changed. You know, Ayurveda is on the brink of a resurgence, not only in India, but also globally. But this requires very level-headed, sober thinking. Ayurveda is here not to show its superiority to other systems of medicine. Ayurveda is being recognized and looked at to fill, you know, really big gaps in the healthcare system. Ayurveda has to bring this idea of cooperation and collaboration. We are not against any other medical systems. And if we find that space, then as an Ayurveda physician, I think we can make a big difference in the modern healthcare setup, not only in India, but also the globe. So I wish and pray that all of you will evolve into great Ayurveda physicians, researchers, and thought leaders in keeping with the great tradition of Charaka, Agnivesha, and that through Ayurveda, we can do our part in making this earth a better and healthy place to live in. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to share some of my thoughts on the history and philosophy of Ayurveda to the new young and aspiring students of Ayurveda. Thank you very much.